you, Brother Dalton. I appreciate that song. Tremendous truth, is it not? Amen. Thanks, Brother Dalton, for singing that. So glad you could do that. Thanks again to all folks who help out. If you need a, if you need a handout tonight and don't have yours from last week or weren't here last week or threw it away, made a paper airplane, raise your hand and the ushers can bring you one. Brother Mitchell's over there, Brother Nciso over there. As we look at tonight, which church? Open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. I sure appreciate all the folks who help out around here, especially the sound and tech guys and the, the men and ladies who run those things to help with that and the guys right now running the cameras, those on live stream and who watch the TV broadcast don't always appreciate as much the guys who stand there. And they stand there without moving very much. All right, they don't want to distract, and so I appreciate them doing that. They have to stand the whole service. Even I don't stand the whole service. I get to stand just the end part. They stand the whole service. I appreciate them doing that. And uh, they usually even get me in the picture sometimes. And for those online, I apologize for that. I'll have them do a better job about that. But I just appreciate all the things that... Uh, that in, in a night of Wednesday night during SOS, Servants of the Savior, all the workers who work with our children and young people. Isn't that a blessing that we can have a, a strong, vibrant children's program and those people who are committed and dedicated to helping train our young people. I'm thankful because there have been men and late women in this church who have influenced my children. And uh, right, for good things, I should say, for good things. And uh, boy, what a blessing to have a place where I can point my children and say, you can follow that man and that lady and follow them as they follow Jesus Christ. Christ, and you reinforce the truths from God's word. And uh, though we may say the same thing, there's sometimes they listen better to you than to me. That's a good thing. I don't mind that. I don't mind that. We're in this together. So I appreciate that. And all those who are not, who can't hear that, but who work with the children and all those ministries. Boy, I think of one ministry that I take for granted and we shouldn't is the nursery. Without a nursery, this, this would be a, it'd be a hot mess in here, would it not? Now, I love children. I do. I'll tell you, if I'm talking to you and a young child walks up, do not be offended if I talk to them. Do take it personally. I like them more than you. <laughs> Don't worry. I mean, uh, one of my buddies, where's Hen Hen little Henry? Hen Henry Scott. Boy, I like him. He was sneaking up on me tonight. Boy, I love little Henry. But so many children I love in here. And, and I love the kids here. And I love the babies, too. I'm not a lady, though. I don't miss holding babies. I don't miss them crying. But I'm thankful nursery workers because they, it would distract. Babies like to cry, and that's what babies do. No complaints about that. But I'm glad that the ladies and the men are willing to work in the nursery and help us out there. I'm just thankful to be in a church where people are willing to serve. Aren't you? Maybe you're not. Aren't you glad to be in a place where people are willing to serve? Amen. And if you're, if you're not serving yet, come and talk to me or one of the assistant pastors. We can find a place for you to serve. There's always things that need to be done. And so have your Bibles open to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, as we continue on the series, What Church and Now Which Church? Why this church? Why First Baptist Church or why a Baptist church? Our text, 1 Timothy 3, uh, starting in verse 15. But if I tarry long... Now thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The Bible calls the church... The pillar and ground of the truth. Timothy, we know, is serving right now in Ephesus. The Bible tells us that when Paul says that I besought you, verse number three, to abide still at Ephesus. The city of Ephesus was known, was known for its idolatry and for its huge temple. With countless pillars, each built by a king. And when Paul referenced that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth, no doubt the congregation, all right, besides Timothy, when he read it to the church, they would have been instantly been able to identify what a pillar did. They could have walked outside the church and the way the city was set up, that it came up to a hill to this great temple. They would have known what a pillar would have done. Each of these pillars would have supported would have supported the roof, supported it. You see, the church supports the truth. Not what is the truth, but who is the truth. Jesus in John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the 
truth and the life. Now, we don't support Jesus in the way that we prop him up. Jesus can stand all by himself. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said the truth does not need to be defended, does not need defending. It needs no more defense than a lion does. You don't defend a lion. You merely open the cage and let the lion out. Jesus, with the truth, can take care of himself, but we support the truth, all right? We follow the truth, and we uplift the truth, not falsehood. As we look through this particular session, these, this particular set in our series, as we look at why this church, I want to talk to us about a few things that pertain to the truth itself. In your notes, you'll see there's a few blanks. If you were here last week, you know them, but the, it's the first one is the call to the church. The church is called to be supported by the truth. We should be girded by the truth. We ought to do things and not do things because of truth. Not just on a whim, not just because of pragmatism, though there are elements in anything that we do that we do them because they work. I mentioned this last week, but if I knew that I could double or triple or quadruple the attendance on a Sunday morning by moving the service to 11.05, we would begin 11.05 this Sunday. Not a moment before and not a moment afterwards. There's nothing in the scripture that says, thou shalt start thy church service in the morning service after Sunday school at 11 a.m. Nothing in there. So if it's 11.05, I'm all for it. 11.07, sure, I'm for it. But we must do things, not just for those reasons, but because of the truth. And we want to meet and do it. So the church is called to be supported by the truth. Number two, there, the church is called to speak the truth. But as I mentioned last week in Ephesians chapter 4, remember what that verse says, beginning and ending of 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love, the end of verse 16, unto the edifying of itself in love, truth ought to be surrounded, especially at church, by love. Now, love, that word love, there's, there's a couple dimensions, there are a couple facets there. Love means my spirit will be a spirit of love, not of anger, irritation, frustration, or bitterness. That's not love. If you're not sure about that, read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. There's not irritation, there's not frustration, there is patience, there is understanding, there's long suffering, there's belief in there. But love also addresses things. When I, when I call to speak the truth, I'm called to address things. There is no love in ignoring. The Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So love also speaks the truth because of love. I have to tell you this. I can't let you continue in this path because of love. The church is called to speak the truth. And number three that we looked at last week, the church is called to strive for the truth. Lord, I pray you'd help us this during these next few moments as we continue to look at this concept of your church, Lord. Lord, may we look at your word and, and may we discern and learn, Lord, maybe some things to be challenged. Lord, may we be on guard as we stand for truth for your sake and for you. Lord, help us, though, to have a sweet spirit, to be kind and compassionate. But Lord, may we not compromise. Lord, may we not give away those things that we're called to embrace. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. The pillar of truth speaks to the idea that the church upholds or supports the truth, but the church is not the source of truth. I do not stand up here before you proclaiming that I am the source of all truth in your life. The source of all truth is Jesus Christ, is God. That is truth. And in so much as I preach what Jesus says, that is truth, if I'm off of my own rant and tangent apart from the Bible, then, then put that aside. I don't claim to be the source of truth, but there are religions out there where the one who is leading the church, a priest, is not only speaking the truth, but the source of truth. In fact, the Catholic doctrine according to their website, their own statement, will say that there are two sources of divine truth. Holy Scripture, and I agree with that, Holy Scripture, and sacred tradition. 
Sacred tradition means, according to their definition, those things passed down throughout generations from the apostles through the priests, the written word and the spoken word. And these sacred traditions are equal to Scripture, what they say. Now, it is not equal to Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Not all teachings from an old guy. Now, they can be helpful along the way. We can learn some things, uh, you know, but, but they are not on par. They are equal. And so the church is not the source of truth as the pillar of truth, but supports and upholds the truth. Tonight, as we look at our notes, there's a blank there. I want to talk about the confusion in church. You may not know this, but there's a lot of churches out there. We talked about that last week in a in America, there's 380,000 religious gatherings in America, or one for every thousand people. And you may not realize this, but they don't all agree. They don't all say the same thing. In that, there are a number of Baptist churches, and they don't all agree. They don't all say the same thing. There are a number of Lutheran churches. They don't all agree. They don't all say the same thing. There are a number of charismatic or Pentecostal churches. They don't all agree. They don't all say the same thing. There is some confusion in church. There's confusion in people's minds about church. The blank there is confusion in the types of church. Some people think that church is for Christmas and Easter, weddings and funerals. And every Christmas I get my good clothes on and I come to church. And Easter I come and boy, I'm good for another six, seven months. And that's my part of church. Others who are a little bit different think you ought to come to church three times a week. Even in the middle of the week. Wow. Different than the Christmas and Easter crowd. There are those who believe you ought to come Sunday morning and you can find the exact spot that fits your needs. Whether it be 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12. There are churches that offer 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 5 o'clock and they're all the same thing. Choose your poison. Others believe, listen, there shouldn't be a big building. There should just be small houses. We'll have little house churches. Just like in the book of Acts, house to house. And we'll have seven, eight people, and that's what we'll do. There's confusion in the types of churches. There are Catholic churches, Lutheran churches, Bible churches, community churches, Mormon, Jehovah Witness, Apostolic, Charismatic, Pentecostal. There's Baptists. There's free will Baptists. There's GARB, Greater, Great Associ Greater Association of, of Regular Baptists. There are Northern American Baptists. There's the American Baptist Convention. There's Southern Baptists. There's the river, the rock, the wind blowing through the trees. There's even, like I've mentioned in some places, churches that are breweries, microbreweries. There's confusion in types of churches. If we're not careful, we will approach this like we do buying something at Walmart. Hmm, I see there that I need pickles. Well, I like dill pickles, and I don't like these pickles. And then when I see dill pickles, I see that there's 15 brands of dill pickles. And there's the cheapo dill pickles, there's the slices, there's the whole dill pickles, there's the spears. And if I really want to spend money, I go to the refrigerated section and find even more pickles. I'm overwhelmed by the pickle selection just at Walmart. I buy pickles. I take them home and I try them. Oh, I like this pickle. I will go back and buy some more. Oh, I don't like this pickle. I will not buy any more. The next week, money's tight. Ah, I can't fit pickles in to my budget this week. So no pickles. I like it. I miss them. Too bad, so sad. When I have more money, then I'll come back and get some more pickles. Some people treat church like buying pickles at Walmart. I find the church. There's lots of churches out there. I can go on the internet. I can look at my phone and I can see, oh, I'll try this church. Oh, I like this one. Oh, I don't like this one. Oh, this kind that I like, there's three or four of them. Oh, I'll try this one. I'll try this one. I'll try this one. Oh, this one fits nice. Oh, I have time this week to go. I'll go. I don't have time this week. Ah, uh, well, wish I could. I feel badly about it, but I'm sure next week I'll have more time. 
There's confusion in churches. Everyone is not the same. Say that again. Everyone's not the same. Which means that everyone can't be right. We're not all the same. We're not all serving the same God. And we're not all going to end up together in heaven. Now, I didn't make that up. I wish everyone would go to heaven. Jesus wishes everyone would go to heaven. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But Jesus also said the way to heaven is narrow. Broad. It's the way it leads to destruction. Narrow. Not everyone can be right. It can't just be, oh, well, you think this, I think this, that's delightful. You like dill pickles, I like sweet pickles. Have a nice day. That's tremendous. Enjoy your pickles. But that is how many people, if I can, even some Baptists, some Christians who believe Jesus Christ, who claim to, 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 to believe the truth, who claim to go to a church that should support the truth, they want to believe that everyone is just okay and we can't really cause too many waves in this operation. It was years ago, there was a famous, famous evangelist, well-known, you would all know his name, but he would, he would ha hold huge crusades. And he would partner with Baptist churches, Lutheran churches, charismatic churches, Pentecostal churches, and Catholic churches. Anyone who would partner with, he would, he would partner with. He would preach a relatively good, clear gospel message. And I am told that when people made, um, uh, uh, when they made confessions of faith, when they repented, all right, they'd fill out decision slips and they would divide those slips up based on proximity to the closest pastor who was partnering with this particular crusade. So as people listen to the gospel and respond to the gospel, which was relatively clear, then they'd give a card to maybe a Catholic priest. And people that went to those crusades, I believe genuinely trusted Christ, as far as I know, and were followed up with or by a Catholic priest. Can you imagine the confusion that, that because we're all in this together. We're all, but we're not. We're not, are we? There's confusion in church. So why this church? Why a Baptist church? Why is it a big deal? There's no doubt there are some, maybe just a few in here or some online, who say, well, pastor, I know what you're saying. I'm not against you. But do you have to make a big deal about it? Yes, I do. We're the pillar and ground of the truth. It's not just your way or my way. It's a big deal. The truth is a big deal because Jesus is the truth. So if it's not a big deal, then what you're saying is, Jesus, you're not a big deal. And he is a big deal. There's confusion in the types of churches, but number two, there's confusion in the teaching of churches. There's confusion in the, in the teaching of churches. I want to give you a few statements from different churches. These particular statements I have gathered from their either doctrinal statements, from their websites, their corporate websites, these are not from other studies. These are things that I researched myself. I, I saw them myself. If you want to come up at some point, I can send you the link where I pulled these things from. I right, did not read them from a book. I went online and uh, I did some searching and said, what is this? I highlighted my notes so that I know wh what they're saying about themselves. This is not, a, as you would say, a straw man argument where I'm building up an argument. This is what they say. We'll talk about, first of all, the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church will say some things like this. There is only one church, the true church. It is a Catholic church, which is a source of the truth. And if you're not part of the true church, you have no part in heaven. They say this about the tradition. The apostles handed on their preaching and writing to all generations through bishops who continue to preach the truth revealed in the gospel and the living transmission of tradition. Tradition infuses the entire life of the church and along with scripture comprises the deposit of the word of God. 
according to what they say on their website about their belief that what the apostles and their doctrines of their church says, with that, with the Bible, now compose the word of God. Now, if you believe what the Bible says, how the word of God is settled in heaven forever, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. If you believe that, then you'd have to believe that what they are bringing down from their tradition is also in heaven from eternity past to eternity future. They're putting it on par with scripture. My Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All right, scripture, God breathed, God gave his word. Seniors, we're dealing with that right now. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Not only that, Catholics believe that when they partake of what they call the Eucharist, we call it the Lord's Supper, communion. When they take the unleavened bread, when they drink of the wine, that that actually becomes the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. The big word is called transubstantiation. This is what they say. The question was, what happens at Catholic Mass? We call this the Eucharist. That when Jesus said, take this and eat, this is my body, take this and drink, this is my blood, he was the giving us the gift of his real presence in the form of bread and wine. They believe that it becomes the literal body of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says, where Jesus says, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Well, I have a problem with that as should you. Let me just work through this a little bit. I'm going to give you some answers with these along the way. You know, because the question can be, well, pastor, he said that, Jesus said this in Mark chapter 14. Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave to them and said, take ye, this is my body. He took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank all of it, or, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Now, in Mark chapter 14, the next verse Verse 25, so he just said, take, eat, this is my body, take, drink, this is my blood. The very next verse, he says, verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So he's passing around what we view to be the Last Supper. Or he's at the Last Supper, he's giving them something to drink and they all pass it around. This, whatever this is in this cup, right? This grape juice, we've looked at the, the alcohol series on that. And he says, this is my blood, Right? And give them flesh, this is my flesh. The Catholics and the Lutherans will stop right there and say, well, this is what happens. But then he goes, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine. Well, wait, I thought you said he was drinking blood. But he references back to the fruit of the vine. Obviously giving a symbol, representation. Throughout scripture, Jesus said things that were representative of something else. I can support this. When Jesus said in John 6, 41, I am the bread of life. He did not say, I represent the bread of life. He said, I am the bread of life. Did he mean that he was physical bread? Yes or no? Did people start to break pieces off his arm and eat him? He didn't say, this is a symbol. No, they understood that when he said, I'm the bread of life, he was implying something else, correct? Yes or no? We don't have to stop there. Jesus in John chapter 15, he said, I am the vine. Right, abide in me. Did all of a sudden, did his, out of his feet grow these roots? And he's this long vine like Jack in the beanstalk? Is that what happened? Or was he represented giving us a figure of something to do? Yes or no? What, 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 what is it? A symbol, Right. Were they surprised that he did not become a vine instantly? Oh, he's still here. I thought you said you're the vine. What are you doing here? No, they understood that he was speaking metaphorically. I can continue. John chapter 10. Jesus said, I am the door. Right? Excuse me, Lord. Got to go inside. Thank you, Lord. Okay. You make a better door than a window. 
Was he at a house? Was he standing between two walls and, and, and the frame? Was he? Was he blocking there and said, you're not getting past me, I'm the door? Yes, but not physically. All right, he said, I'm the door to what? To eternal life. All right, no man comes from the Father, but by me. All right, I'm the door. I'll lead you that way. Not a physical wood door or metal door or a fire-rated door or a nine-panel glass door or a front door or a back door or a garage door. You understand that he was speaking figuratively. The disciples that night would have understood that as well if they'd listened to Jesus every day for the last three years, who often spoke in parables with symbols, giving significance in their meanings, and then went on to say, take heed, this is my body. They wouldn't say, oh, you know what, that's weird, because Jesus has talked this way for three years, and now he switches. doesn't make any sense. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Right? Did he have a staff in his hand? Some sheep, bah, bah, or they run around there? All right, well, he was referring to us as sheep, not that we're sheep, but we're sheep. We have some attributes of the sheep, don't we? We're not real bright. Oh, don't leave me hanging. Can I get an amen there? At least for my sake, you say, yeah, yeah, Pastor, we know that. And Jesus guides us like a shepherd, right? How about this? Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says to his disciples and to us, ye are the light of the world. Does he mean we're a light bulb? LED? Fluorescent? No. Not literally. He says we're the salt of the earth. We table salt, rock salt, kosher salt, block of salt, salt lick. Well, no, of course not. So I think it's very, it is not ethical to treat that passage that way when Jesus clearly throughout his ministry, throughout his teaching, spoke in a figurative and symbolic manner many, 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 many times. I could continue, but for sake of time, I think so when Jesus stood up there and said, take, eat, this is my body, I do not believe for a moment that they, in their understanding of what Jesus was saying or in their experience with Jesus Christ, said, oh, that's right, now this actually is your body or becomes your blood. On a side note, if Jesus said, this is my blood, okay, Jesus had not died yet. In a theological sense, he'd not died yet. So why would he give up his blood before he died to the disciples if his blood is incorruptible, right? In a theological sense, he wouldn't have. Obviously, I believe the only thing that fits is the fact that it's a symbol. That's what Corinthians tells us. For as oft as you eat this and drink this, you do show. You do show. You do show. Oh, like it's a symbol, not like it actually happens but a very, a very deep doctrine in the Catholic Church. Part of Mass, a full Mass, will have, will have the Eucharist in, in the service. Catholics also say this about Mary. We believe that Mary was conceived without sin. That's what they, they said. That Mary was sinless. They continue in that same, in that same, uh, uh, those same thoughts about Mary. As with the saints, we ask Mary to pray for us, to her son and to the Father and the Holy Spirit. They worship Mary, according to what they say. And Mary was sinless. My Bible says, for, for, wherefore as by one man, sin entered the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all Men, for that all have sinned. Right? Men there not being male, but reverencing the entire mankind. Mary was not born sinless. The only one born sinless was Jesus Christ. Only one. Mary had an earthly father. Jesus had a heavenly father. 
By the way, we don't pray to Mary. Mary, as we pray to her, gets us nowhere. We're never commanded to pray to Mary. The other places they'll talk about how, like a mother has influence on her son, so Mary influences her son. Do moms have influence on their sons? Well, not as much as they want to sometimes. Moms, right? And more than the sons want to admit. But Jesus was not controlled by Mary. And he says that we can approach the throne boldly, not through Mary, through him. I'll continue with that. Where It says, why do Catholics pray to saints? We believe that holy men and women who have come before us still pray for us and aid us. We ask, when we pray to saints, we ask for their intercession. The same way you'd ask your family and friends to pray for you. First Timothy, same book, chapter 2, verse number 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. The only one. We don't pray, we don't pray to, to the saints. Catholics, you have the Mormons. Mormons believe that uh, Jesus and the devil are brothers. That Jesus and the devil are brothers. That means they have the same father, God. So when the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that that's not true. They'd have to say he gave one of his begotten sons. But my Bible says, Only begotten son. Like there's only one. Right? That you don't have to count past one. There's only one. Not two, not three, not four. They believe, according to the Mormon belief, from their articles of faith on their website, that the Bible, as the Word of God, and, well, as far as it's correctly translated, they say, and in the Book of Mormon, as equally an important scriptural source. You notice how both Catholic and Mormons say, you know what, the Bible, this is the word of God alongside of, in addition to, these other things that are on the same level. They're the same playing field, the word of God and the tradition from the, the, the saints, the Catholics say, the word of God, the Mormons say, and the Book of Mormon on the same playing field. They say, the Mormons say, that uh, Jesus will establish his new kingdom on the American continent. And this comes from the revelation given to the prophet Joseph Smith. You didn't know this, did you? Their plan of salvation. The Mormons, they believe that prior to being born, each person has a pre-mortal life. In the pre-mortal realm, spirits dwell with God the father of all people. And they develop talents and knowledge to prepare for mortal life. And when the preparation is complete, they progress and they spend time on earth and they gain a physical body. They practice actively choosing between good and evil. And they gain new levels of knowledge that will allow them to become like God. And the ultimate goal of a Mormon is, is spiritual development to be like God. They believe that in death, the spirit leaves the body and moves on to the spirit world to await the resurrection. The plan of salvation that heaven is divided into three separate kingdoms of glory, the terrestrial, and the celestial. The Lutherans. Lutherans believe, according to the, the Missouri Synod, that there are that, that baptism is, is not absolutely necessary for salvation. There are some believers who are saved without baptism. But there are, clearly, there are clearly other ways of coming to faith by the power of the Holy Spirit besides faith. My Bible says without faith it is impossible to please him. Baptism is not a mere, they say, ritual or symbol, but a powerful means of grace by which God grants faith in the forgiveness of sins. They say this from the Missouri Synod website, those churches which deny baptism to infants usually do so because they have a wrong understanding of baptism. That piqued my interest when I was reading. They see baptism as something someone does, I, or e.g., a public profession of faith. That's what I would say. 
that baptism is a public profession of faith. I would say that baptism is like a wedding ring. It lets everyone else know that I'm, I'm taken. I can still be married and take off my wedding ring. You better believe Green knows I'm still married. Take off my wedding ring. But I put this on to show everyone else out there that, listen, I'm married. You get baptized, but why do we think that, all right? Rather, they say, than seeing it's something that God does for us and in us. If it's something that God does for us, then why did Jesus get baptized? Peter says this, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But later on, and, and they'll claim that as part of the support for that, Peter says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted. It's in Acts 2 and 3. See, Peter was not equating baptism to salvation. He was merely tying the responses together. And the Ethiopian was saved. He said, what doth hinder me from being baptized? A response after salvation. Acts will tell us as many as were saved were, were baptized, saved and baptized, added to the church. A response to salvation. Also on the website for the Missouri Synod of Lutherans, they say, someone asked this, is it possible for one to lose his salvation? Because you say in your thesis on justification that believers have eternal assurance, which is it? So the question is, can you lose your salvation? You've said this, but you've also said you have assurance. The answer is this. Lutherans believe, from the Lutheran website, both believe both are true and scriptural. It is possible for a believer to fall from faith and lose salvation, and it is possible for a believer to have complete assurance of eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Which is it? Both are true. They both can't be true. They both can't be true. Jesus said it this way. The Bible says this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have temporal life that may come and go. John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, am I a man? Are you a man in this, in this reference? Mankind, right? So if I can lose my salvation, I'd be in this verse that I cannot do that. If you could make me lose my salvation, this verse prohibits that. If you could make it happen for yourself, this verse prohibits that. Nothing can pluck them. No man can pluck them out of his father's hand. Ephesians, in whom he also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. After you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes and he seals you with the promise. How good is the Holy Spirit seal? It's got to be really solid, my friend. In fact, my Bible says it's rock solid. Nothing can break that seal. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Of course, John says, These things have I written unto you, that ye believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, that ye may believe the Son of God. There's confusion in the teaching of churches, and there's confusion last night, very quickly, in the tradition of churches. There's just confusion all around us. A few days ago, I read this particular quote on Facebook. I will read it for you tonight. Kind of talk through just a little bit. Because there are issues and there are preferences. There are a number of churches who we'd line up on most doctrines. And where we're going with this particular series, eventually I'll get to our fundamentals and then why we're Baptists. The quote was this. America has a president that is promoting the transgender lifestyle, the LBGTQ movement, abortion, and the anti-Christ agenda. Yet some Christians want to fight over translations, facial hair, worship styles, and clothing. Remember who the real enemy is, Ephesians 6, 12. Now don't say amen yet, please. I'm going to tell you why, what I have a problem with this statement. All right, so what they say in that statement is that in, in our leadership we have someone who is against what we believe from the Bible, the sanctity of marriage, all right, the way God created humanity, the value of life, and against Jesus Christ himself. I would not disagree that in authority over us that those things would be true. 
But then they make this statement, yet Christians, some Christians want to fight over translations, facial hair, worship styles, and clothing. I read that and I was called because this is a terrible statement. You need to be on guard for this. They equated translations, the version of the Bible, with the hair on my face, the length of the hair on my face. Now, at first glance, you read that statement and say, oh, that's right, people get off track. You argue about dumb things. And sometimes Christians do argue about dumb things. Let me have an amen on that one. We know that. But this translation, the King James translation, is not just a good idea. It's not just a preference. It is a solid belief in the providential preservation of the word of God. And what I believe about this is in no way connected to how long my facial hair is. I have facial hair whether I shave it off, trim it, or let it grow, I still have facial hair. Right? Whether you can see it, identify it or not, I still have facial hair. Who cares about this? Right? If you want to grow out to here, I don't care. You just say, well, ma'am, before you go to the nursery, can you please trim it back? No, no. Facial hair is not the same as this right here. And the worship style is not the same as this. They're saying that how we worship and approach God in worship is the same as whether you wear Levi's or Dockers or a suit. Not the same. Not the same. In fact, worship in the Bible, uh, Abel and Cain both tried to worship God. God said one was accepted, one was rejected. Nadab and Abihu, they tried to worship God in their own style, and God said, no, you can't worship me that way with that strange fire. You're done. One scholar that I read counted over 8,000 times that worship was referred to, mentioned, and uh, given to us in the Bible. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Worship's a big deal. The translation is a big deal. Last week I talked about this, and I'll be real quick and I'll be done. I talked about the translation, how people are wanting to change again. I talked about how in 1 Peter, people were, were talking about how they go from uh, an inheritance, talking about inheritance from God, incorruptible, undefiled and faded not away. The new version will change it to, instead of incorruptible, imperishable. Boy, that just brings clarity to the conversation. I mentioned that last Wednesday night, how my daughter, Danielle, will read from the King James Bible and that she'll ask me sometimes for a word that doesn't make sense or she'll ask Alexa. In fact, this morning, you know, sitting there in my chair, she's in the other room, and she goes, Alexa, what does abomination mean? Fair enough. Well, I preached on this, talked about this last Wednesday night. Thursday, the kids are not here in their SOS, so they did not know what I said in here or anything, okay? Thursday, I'm driving home. I said, kids, you know, I, said, I was talking about you guys last night in, in church and how sometimes you guys don't understand words from the, from, from, from the King James Bible. And I talked about incorruptible. I said, Johnny, what does incorruptible mean? And Johnny says, oh, Dad, it means um, it doesn't, I think he said, doesn't rot. It doesn't rot. So, Danielle, what does incorruptible mean? Danielle's in uh, first grade, second grade? First, second grade. Okay, close enough. I only missed it by a three. You know, she's not, a, she's not a junior yet. She goes, oh, Dad, it means not uh, it, it doesn't it corrupt. It doesn't like not corrupt. It, it doesn't corrupt. I said, okay. I said, you know that some Bibles want to change it. I said to imperishable, and you couldn't make this up. I couldn't make this up. She goes, Daddy, what does that mean? It's worse than that. You have your Bibles hope, still open, and hopefully to First Timothy, right, chapter three, verse I read, verse sixteen. The Bible says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, this is a powerful verse. Paul says, remember, without controversy, this thing, this is established, that this is great, this mystery of godliness is great. And and then what he's doing, he's going to explain, all right, explain what godliness, this mystery of godliness is. Are you ready for it? Look at the verse. Now, look with me. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, Believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Powerful verse. The ESV. ESV. Popular version these days. Popular when I was in college. And I should mention this along the way. Some of you know my background, some of you don't. I, I in college, used the ESV. 
I didn't, I didn't, my whole life, I didn't grow up this, in this complete circle, all right? And uh, I'm here by conviction, not just because it's the only way I ever heard my whole life, all right? So I was in college, the idea was, if you were smart, use a different version than King James. In fact, when I told one of my classmates, I'm only going to use a King James, they said, J.D., I thought you were smarter than that. The ESV says this, and look, look at the King James, look at verse 16, if you would. And it says, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen of angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed out in the world, taken up in glory. I understand what they did there. Did you notice a big change? Instead of it saying God was manifest in the flesh, it said he was manifest in the flesh. Now understand what that verse now says. Landon, I need you real quick. Yeah. Come here. What that verse is saying now, that other version, you turn around, look at them. It says not, here's a mystery of godliness, God was, Here's the mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh. Is Landon manifest or revealed in the flesh? Yes or no? Yeah, right? I can. All right? John tells us that our hands have handled the word of life. All right? So is it, is it a mystery that, that somebody would be born, manifest in the flesh? The verse goes on, right? And it says that uh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels. Can Landon be seen by angels? Yeah. Could Landon be proclaimed among the nations? Welcome to, welcome to social media. Could he be believed on in the world? Yes or no? Could he be taken up into glory, received up into glory? Could he go to heaven? So where's the mystery in that? There's no mystery if it's just he. The mystery is God was manifest in the flesh. Thanks, buddy. Not just he was. Most popular Bible right now according to sales, has been for about, I believe, 12 years, is the NIV. Guess what it says? He appeared in the flesh. In the New King James, it says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But next to God, there's a little, little letter. Little letter. Footnote. If you go down the footnote, this is what the New King James does. This is one of the differences why we don't use the New King James. In the footnote, it says, he. So rather than, than do what God says, we'll just let you know, actually, it just really means he, but we don't make you feel bad, so we'll put God there. So you feel nice about it. This is a big deal when what I use now undermines the doctrine. The doctrine. And I have more, but i got to stop tonight. you got to get out of here. And uh, pillar and ground of the truth. I'll pick up there next week.